Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, okay, so let me just talk a little bit about products that count. So we are about 17,000, I think 18,000 strong now, a group of uh, product managers, innovators, et cetera. Started in the Bay Area in San Francisco um, and expanded to London and now in New York. We have a newsletter, so you should be receiving those as well. We do monthly speaker series. Um, we have also rich content on our site, podcasts, as well as an executive product, uh, product leaders retreat. Before I introduce our illustrious speaker tonight, I just want to thank... Is that the code for old? No, not at all. Not at all. Illustrious. Uh, I, I do want to thank our, uh, our venue, Digital Ocean, for this lovely, lovely space, the awesome food, the awesome drinks. And I want to invite Shivin uh, to the front, who is the VP of product here at Digital Ocean, to just share a few words. Big, big, big applause. All right. Well, thank you. How's everybody doing today? Good. This is a packed crowd for this meetup. That's awesome. Um, so just a little bit about uh, DigitalOcean. We are a cloud computing platform for developers. How many actually, how many of you know about DigitalOcean? Raise your hand. So about a third of the room, that's great. Uh, for those of you who don't, um, we are based here in New York um, and are building products to help developers scale their applications. Um, so your engineering teams may know of us. And we just recently hit a million accounts, which is a big milestone for us. So uh, a really enough good to progress. Pay for pizza, right? Yeah. Cool. Just enough to pay for the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and we're really excited to host this meetup. Uh, it's a great venue for product managers and great for New York to have a forum like this and amazing speakers. So we're very thrilled to be hosting this and hope you enjoy um, the rest of the talk. All right, so many of you know Gibson Biddle, but for those of you who don't, uh, super excited to have him here tonight. He is the former VP of product at uh, Netflix, as well as the CPO at Chegg. Um, he is also now executive in residence product for several startups and does lectures at Stanford and Dartmouth. So please give him a round of applause. Super excited to have him. <laughs> Gib, take it away. Thank you. How are you doing? Uh, Andrea gave you the background. I, I put Elmo here. The, the first product ever built was Elmo's Preschool with, with, with um, the Children's Television Workshop in New York City. That was the year that Oprah threw Tickle Me Elmo's into the audience. And that, that's called good luck. Um, and then Andrea described the fact that I'm an EIR product. That's code for I work three days a week for different companies. Okay, Very fancy title. Uh, I want to start with some product questions for you. Um, and think about this in the context of Netflix. And Netflix is trying to help, help connect you with movies that you love. So my question, you're the algorithm. Do French and Americans have similar movie tastes? So how many believe that everybody in France will like Hollywood blockbuster movies just as much as Americans? And how many believe that? The opposite is true. Well, you're all wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, so it turns out Hollywood is expert in, in understanding universal themes. So you've just learned that about worldwide movie tastes. So the next question is demographic data important in understanding what kind of movies people like? Is it helpful for Netflix to know that my daughter Kelsey is 22 years old? And the dad is an awkward age, somewhere north of 50. Okay? So how many believe that demographic data is important in understanding people's movie tastes? And how many people believe it's not important? Well, you're right this time. Okay? Fascinating. Should rows float? So Netflix, if you look carefully, it's, it's rows of movies, row after row after row after row. And years ago, we got rid of tabs. And it would be awkward if you showed up at a website and the, the main tab or the tabs across the top were different words, et cetera. Context of rows, the question is, when I show up at a website, it'll say top 10 for Gibson, and the second one will be uh, continue watching, and the third might be 
Gibbs favorite bang bang shoot 'em ups. The question is, should those row structures be the same for all of you or different for all of you? Will it freak people out to have haphazard rows? So how many believe that the row structure should be consistent? And how many people believe it should not? Well, you guys are getting smarter already, okay? It's the latter. Should Netflix kill House of Cards? <laughs> how long did that decision take? <laughs> Unbelievable. It was, there, was, there was a problem on the weekend, and by, sat, by Monday, Netflix decided to, to, to kill season six. That's rapid decision making for a big company. Here's another one. Should Netflix send a reminder before your free trial ends? So how many of you are Netflix members? Thank you for paying my kids' college bills. I don't know if you remember, but today you, you hit a button that says uh, join free for a month. And the question is, a day before that free month period ends, should Netflix nicely remind you that a day later, they're going to hit your credit card because they already have it. How many believe Netflix should send you a nice reminder? And how many people believe you shouldn't? Now, this is a cliffhanger, OK? <laughs> this is going to be our case at the end of the meeting. We'll discuss it, OK? You guys were 50-50, not a surprise. All right, so I'm bringing you into the room at Netflix. So Netflix, this is part of the culture. The company encourages independent decision making by employees. So how did they make such a fast decision about House of Cards? It was Cindy Holland's decision to make. She's the head of content. Do it or not. Share information openly, broadly, and deliberately. I've just shared insight about the algorithms at Netflix. And, and I, I know these because they were shared throughout the company. Netflix employees are extraordinarily candid with each other. They keep only our highly effective people, and they avoid rules. What's interesting or not interesting about working for this company when you read this list? How many are in? How many are a little scared? Yeah, OK. This is what the Netflix culture is about. Um, and so I, I wrote, um, about three months ago, I, I wrote something. It was 17 minutes long on Medium, which I've come to understand is really long. <laughs> okay? And I got applauses and other stuff that I guess is good. Um, but it was really boring. It was how to run a quarterly product strategy meeting. Uh, and this talk is kind of about that, but there was no way I was going to have a presentation about running a meeting. Okay? Um, but I'm going to share with you how at Netflix we thought about strategy. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit about this meeting. But then we're going to drop you into a quarterly product strategy meeting, and we're going to debate that case. Should Netflix remind you before your free trial period ends? So I'm going to share with you two models for the ways I think about strategy. The first is called Glee. And yes, there's an episodic TV series named after this model. And another one I call the DMH model. And then I'm going to reveal to you when I stood up in front of a a room about like this with about this number of people at Netflix talking about what we're going to do over the next 10 years or so. I'm going to outline the strategy from then. So uh, strategy. I found it to be super important. Uh, the way I think about it, it's a plan to achieve a long-term goal. And I'm going to stress long-term. Did anybody read Jeff Bezos' writing yesterday? He talked about think about what you can do not over one or two years, but over five or six or seven or eight years. Uh, and that's when amazing things are going to happen. And one of these models is encouraging you to think longer term. In product, the way I think about strategy is they're simply hypotheses for how to build customer and shareholder value. That's the way I think about them. And then tactics are pretty easy in the work that we do. They are simply projects or experiments to prove or disprove these different high-level strategies, these theories. So strategy, long term. Tactic is going to be substantially shorter term. Imagine you're trying to create a culture where there's no rules and processes. So I found that strategy was the most effective way of getting everybody on the same page without telling them what to do. 
The intent is it's like we're going to go dominate the world. I'm going I'm to show you in the model how I thought about that. What I love is it provides disciplined thinking without process, without rules. And then the product manager, how many are product managers in the room? It's a freaking hard job, right? How many are product managers in startups? Your life is even worse, OK? <laughs> so the job is create 100 ideas about things that might work, prioritize them, and hope to hell you're going from prioritized order from the top to the bottom, OK? That's the job. And strategy is a great way of, of ordering that list. It's a very nice way of saying no. Like, why is that idea on strategy? And the person's like, never mind. OK? All right, so Glee. How many have watched this? Yeah, thank you for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Glee. Uh, the model is, it's the first letter that's important. Get big on the first thing. And then we're going to lead the next thing. And then we're going to get even bigger via expansion. I tend to think of these three bullets as sort of five-year chapters of a company's life. So I'll show you how I applied the model at Netflix. Since 2005, I said, we're going to get big on DVDs. Everybody knows what a DVD is in this room? OK, good, thank you. And then the next idea was the next chapter of our lives, we were going to lead downloading. Now, the language was purposeful because the, the phrase streaming wasn't invented yet. If you said streaming to a customer, they thought you were saying streamlining, and that sounded very, very bad. Okay? And then what's the third chapter of Netflix's life? Yeah, you're all jumping. You're all jumping to get big on original content. So I will be honest with you. In 2005, we said chapter three was at a moment when we were no longer having to do DVDs by mail and all the complicated hub and spoke systems of mail when we were streaming only, then we would expand internationally. Okay? And I, I will tell you, we did a test in 2006, 2007 of exclusive content. And what happened? We failed, right? It was about 2009, 2010, finally 2012 with House of Cards that we understand the fourth chapter of Netflix's life, which is to, to essentially out HBO before out HBO, out Netflix's Netflix. And who's winning? I want you all to buy Netflix stock and support my daughter's medical school bills, OK? <laughs> all right, so the concept here is you're, you're thinking further term. You're thinking about how you could dent the universe in the long term. Uh, Yahoo's a negative example here. Sorry if you're a Yahoo person. You know, what was the thing after Yahoo? I don't know, OK? But you can see how uh, Netflix, you know, through a lot of good luck, uh, we, we caught the, the wave of streaming and then eventually caught the wave of original content, which is awesome. Okay, so the second model. The job is to delight customers in margin-enhancing, hard-to-copy ways. And margin-enhancing is just a fancy word for saying, let's make money. Okay? Anybody on board with that idea? Um, so I'm just going to nicely remind you of how sucky Netflix was. So this is the home page in 1999. Designers in the house? Where's my RISD pal? This is good, right? It's excellent. Oh, your, your words hurt me. Um, OK, so there were about, gosh, a disk cost 4 bucks to rent. It would magically show up in about seven days. And you could choose from 4,000 titles. Okay? And this is the working it out phase of Netflix. Okay? Still a lot going on, right? And this is, um, this is Kelsey. This is my daughter. Because I am not that into grays of anatomy or gossip girl, no matter what you may think about me. <laughs> so what are all the things that delight you about Netflix? What do you think is cool about it? Recommendations. Recommendations. Any country. Any country. What else is good? You can binge watch. It's anytime, anywhere. You don't have to wait. Uh, skip the intro. You can skip the intro. Quality. Quality. Uh, full on HD sound, etc. No ads. Watch. Oh my gosh, you can watch on an airplane. What do you got? 
profiles for his daughters who apparently, like mine, don't have the same taste as me. Okay? These are all the things that delight you. So here's a full-on list. Wouldn't it be cool if you said, hey, walk in your bedroom and it knows it's me when I say, play something that's good for me? That's the voice and ID and control at the bottom, which is the next wave. All right, so the margin enhancing. Anybody a member of Netflix circa 2002? Do you remember how much you paid? It was 22 bucks a month. And you had to have three DVDs on top of your television at any moment in time. Okay? Because we were building a service for us. We called ourselves Silicon Valley Freaks or LA Movie Buffs. And it had to be 22 bucks. And we struggled. Like, how could we make it a less expensive service? And someone had the insight, maybe two disks or maybe one disk. <laughs> okay? And then started inventing plans that only cost 14 bucks or 8 bucks. Today, most of you are spending 10 or 11 bucks. Okay? Anybody know how many streams you have that you can watch concurrently? Anybody sharing their accounts with each other? <laughs> okay? Yeah, yeah, this happens. It's all good. It's all good. So these were some of the price and plan experiments. Uh, yes, we had advertising for two or three years. Uh, it was, it was a, we made money at a time where it was really hard to make money. Long tail content. Does anybody know what that means? Obscure stuff. Obscure stuff. Okay, so it turns out for Netflix in the DVD era, there's 100,000 DVDs to choose from. The, the expensive blockbuster releases, the new releases that just came out, cost us three bucks to send back and forth in the mail. But the obscure stuff, a title that's over a year old, give me an obscure title. Um, I guess the cabinet of Dr. Okay, has anyone watched the cabinet, cabinet of Dr. Car Guy? Yeah. Oh my God, it's not as obscure as we thought. That one only cost a buck. So this is an example where, where, uh, where personalization helped to create a substantial cost savings, a way for Netflix to make money. OK, now I need you to marvel, because it took me a long time to prepare this hard to copy slide. Do you get it? Yeah. You with me? OK, good. Um, so what are the things that are hard to copy about the work that we do in, in building technology-based products? What are all the reasons that you're not going to take 50 million to start a company that competes with Netflix today. A lot of data. What kind of data? Oh my god, Netflix knows the taste of 100 million people worldwide and the people in France have similar movie tastes as people in the United States. You're freaking me out. What else is hard to copy? Highly personalized. I'm going to call that unique technology. Okay, so how, what are all the algorithms that, that do that? What else is hard to copy? Brand what, what, what? Brand. You see red, like, am I going to give my credit card to this company called Netflix? Sure. Okay, that wasn't the true in the old days. <laughs> okay, what else is hard to copy? Licensing. Licensing. So Netflix was able to spend $300 million to do The Crown, a new episodic series, where Hulu can only afford to spend... 80 million. Netflix has got 110 million. Hulu's maybe got 20 million. Now, what do I call that? Cash what's flow. I call it cash flow. What, what, what's the business term for this hard to copy element? Dan, can you help me? I heard it over here. Oh, you, you're getting you get switching costs. That's very good of you. Um, okay, so I call it economies of scale. So Netflix is so big it can afford to spend that money. And you got it. Switch, was it you who said switching costs? I was you. Oh, take full credit. Okay. Um, so Netflix knows the taste for you and everybody in your family. And you're not going to go to Hulu because Hulu doesn't really understand you. Right? And they do advertising. Okay. So these are all the things that are hard to copy. And I, I gave you some examples. The only thing we didn't do, network effect. Okay. So today, if you walk into any store to buy a television, it's going to stream Netflix automatically, any device you buy. Huge network effect. Imagine how long it took to con all of those folks into doing that. Okay. How many of you have multiple family members, different profiles? Good. That was a failed experiment, by the way, in 2005. Only 2% of our members used profiles. Then we killed it, and all hell broke loose. 
We were ruining people's marriages, okay? And it turned out every person on our board was using profiles, okay? <laughs> so finally, we reestablished it, you know, 2010, and it's important, and it, it keeps you, it keeps you in the family, it keeps you paying, which is awesome. Okay, so I just gave you, think about all the theories and hypotheses and the intersection of things that delight you, they help build margin, and they're also hard to copy. So there's a subset of ideas that I will reveal to you in a minute. I'll share what I showed Netflix back in 2005. But here are all the high-level hypotheses. Over five years, we experimented with all of these theories and hypotheses about how to delight customers in hard-to-copy, margin-enhancing ways. What percent worked? 10% worked. Ye of little faith. You can look at them. How many are a part of Netflix today? Eight. OK, that's about, you're, you're saying that you're more hopeful. Uh, we got it 65% right. I'm going to hit the button, and uh, green is good and red is bad. You ready? Look at the ones that are both red and green. So I already revealed that we tested exclusive content in 2007, failed. We didn't have the economy of scale yet to afford 300 million on an episodic TV series. But it obviously worked back in the day when House of Cards was a good thing. Okay? We opened up our APIs to let a thousand flowers bloom. We thought developers would help us create unique movie finding tactics. No flowers bloomed. But all of that work was the stuff that enabled all of our partners to create Netflix-ready devices, to build this substantial device ecosystem. Does anybody remember Friends with Netflix? Yes, you're smiling. Why are you smiling? It was great. It was great. But only 8% of our members used it. Why is that? I, 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 I love you for being a New York City product freak. Okay? I was one, too. Why didn't the rest of you use friends? You don't want to share. You don't want to share? And what's wrong with your friends? Your friends have sucky movie tastes. Okay? So we killed friends, and nobody cared. <laughs> oh, well. Um, so th think about the, the positive uh, results and the negative. Winning hypotheses, failing hypotheses. All right. So the product strategy for me, it's a combination of the Glee model of using this DMH model. And then one level detail, I'm going to show the projects against each of the strategies, and I'm going to show the metrics that helped us to measure whether we were making progress against these various strategies or hypotheses. So thank you. It's 2005. I'm going to talk about where we're taking the product. My metric, my job, is to improve retention. At the beginning of Netflix's life, about 8% of members canceled each month. Today, 2% cancel each month. That's a lot better, right? And why do those 2% cancel each month? There's only two reasons. Sure. Cards expired, they, run out of money. they ran out of money. That's one point. And the second point is? Yeah, <laughs> I like that. They died. <laughs> 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 or you got to sleep sometime. Okay? It's close. It's summer, and I start feeling guilty about binge watching, and maybe I should go play in the park with my kids. Maybe there's better stuff to do. Uh, and there was a very specific formula to how to optimize retention against cost. All right, and I already showed you. Hey, we're going to get big on DVDs, we're going to lead downloading, and then we're going to expand worldwide. Now I'm going to look smart, okay? Because I promise you in 2005, 2006, I had these four theories, but I probably had two or three others that didn't work, like friends or like exclusive content or whatever. But example, hey, we're going to focus on personalization. We're going to get your disk to you instantly in the mail. Turns out that was really important before streaming. And then what's better than streaming instantly? Lots of business model experiments. And then we had a theory that we were building a wonderful product for Silicon Valley friends. Uh, uh, Silicon Valley freaks and LA movie buffs. And we needed to create a service that was simple that eventually the rest of the world were, would embrace. So these were four, these were winning 
theories and hypotheses. Of course, they spelled something, PIME, that I could remember. Okay? Um, but think of all the failed theories as well. Anybody remember the Netflix prize? So that was a tactic against the personalization theory. We had one engineer doing collaborative th filtering. We said we'd give a million bucks to somebody who did a better job than us. And then we had 1,000 engineers working on it. Okay? That was cool. These are all different projects or tactics against these top level theories. And then the key thing was to measure using these various metrics, are we making progress? So I decided to spend a little time on one that's hard, which is how do you measure if something is easy or not? And I'm going to tell you the proxy metric that we used. We said a person shows up, they type in their credit card, and they've started their free trial period. And this is the DVD era. They had to add at least three titles to their quay, because that's how Americans said that word. Okay? <laughs> um, and so the question is, in the early days, what percentage of customers in that first session added at least three titles to their queue? And this was our proxy for were we making the service simple enough so that they would understand and get the value back, which is we were going to start sending them those titles and the lists as soon as we can. Does anybody want to guess at the beginning how we did against this proxy metric? It's a number between 0 and 100. 20. OK, we have two cynics. I heard about the same number. Next, some youthful enthusiasts. 62, I mean, that is so freaking close, 60, OK? So in the early days, 60% would do this. And then after a year or two of work pounding on this, what did we get it to? 92%, OK? And did in retention improve? Yes. yes, OK? So this is how you measure whether you're making progress on this theory of simple. And we could do it for all of the others. In each case, these are proxy metrics. The high level of metric was retention. Retention is really hard to move. Okay? So we needed these proxy metrics to see if we were making progress on each of these ideas. I'm going to leave you with one more idea to think about over the course of Netflix. I described these three chapters from DVD by mail to, to streaming and then original content. Personalization was wicked good, okay? and I'll explain why. In the era of DVD, you had 100,000 DVDs to choose from. And via personalization, we could help find those needles in a haystack that were also cheaper for you. When we launched streaming in 2007 in January, we launched with 400 sucky titles. And the magic was, could we find one title that you liked? Okay? And now think about what Netflix is doing today. When they make a bet, on Stranger Things, how many have finished season two? Good. You feel good about yourself? <laughs> awesome. Work suffered for a day, but it's OK. Um, Netflix, it really, in, in evaluating these different choices, the question is, what's the right level of investment? So with Stranger Things, I'm sure they spent one or $200 million. Okay? What's an obscure episodic TV series from Netflix? Freaks and geeks. So for that, Netflix probably invested $5 million for, for all 500,000 freaks and geeks that are part of the Netflix. Hey, no laughing at the freaks and geeks. <laughs> okay. So Netflix knows everybody's member taste. And all they're doing is getting the right level of investment right against the, uh, how many viewers they think will enjoy it. Now, are they using all that data to inform storytellers on, on, on the right content? Ooh, how many believe yes? How many believe no? OK, the no's have got it. Okay, Netflix is sort of number two in the creative community. All the cool kids want to work for HBO still. Um, but, but Netflix is given a lot of freedom and license. And, and bringing data and engineering to it would, would be bad. Um, so they, they'd say, hey, we're going to spend $80 million. Use it as you will. Okay? How many minutes long should a TV episode be? Whatever. Anyways, I just want to show you over the three chapters how important this idea of personalization was. Occasionally, I have a quote, and I'm like, 
who said this? And I'm like, I couldn't find anybody. So I've attributed this quote to myself, OK? <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 like, I explained to someone, I have like a man crush on Jeff Bezos. Like, like Amazon, the reason they're so successful is because they're failing so fast. How many remember the, the, the phone from Amazon that they could not sell for $0, OK? <laughs> and how many are using Alexa today? Okay. That's a company that was willing to fail fast and now is a leader in voice. Incredibly impressive. And it's largely so they're so great at experimenting and failing. And I, I promise Netflix, like I, I, I revealed the long list of failures. All right, so now we're getting ready. We're getting ready for our first Netflix product strategy meeting. There's going to be laughing. There's going to be crying. No, nobody will die. So the prep for this is the first is to have a high level strategy, have these tactics, have the metrics. But then you want to push it down to the next level. And I'm going to show you what that meant for me at Netflix. Um, I, I've given you the high level. The, the, the reason that I outlined the strategy, and we'll do the same for at least one of the swim lanes, is we're providing the context for strategy. So everybody in the room knows what's important or what's not. In the meeting, we're going to share, but we're also going to debate. And anything I learn in my swim lane, I'm going to make sure you and your swim lane learn quickly and easily. So remember those questions I gave you at the beginning, French versus American taste? I, I promise Netflix employees will get every one of those right, because there's been a lot of sharing of results and learnings across the company. And then I'm going to share some future hypotheses about what would make, uh, you know, in th today's case, we're going to do non-member experience. The idea is that we build the business maturity of everyone in the room. And business maturity has nothing to do with age. It means do you make good decisions about business, about the product, and about people. Uh, and it's an important concept of Netflix. And then in each case, I mean, in Netflix, I had about 10 swim lanes. I had a product manager for personalization and one for non-member site and one for friends, poor guy. Um, one for streaming, one for DVDs, et cetera. The key question is, what's the right level of investment in each of those swim lanes? So I had 10 swimmers. In fact, I had 12 swimmers, because we had two people swimming in the personalization lane. Okay? Like, how do you get a higher cadence pace? Well, we'll have two different product managers that can double the list of experiments in any quarter. Well, that's cool. So um, before a strategy meeting, each product manager would outline their strategy in their swim lane, their tactics, and their metrics. And I'm going to share one of them for you in the, in the non-member area, which is why I, I've, I've bolded non-member. So in each of these swimmers, do just what I did at the highest level, which is, hey, here's how I think I'm going to move my metrics with the strategies. Here's the list of projects or tactics, and here are the metrics that I use to measure success or failure along the way. This is the Netflix non-member site. Its job is to get you to click the red button. Okay? Remember what it looked like in 1999? This is better. Okay? Click the button, credit card, one month free trial. So now imagine I'm, I'm the product ma manager in this area. Here are my metrics. This year, I have to find a way that 30 million new members will join the service. Easy, right? What are my metrics? T over V. So two out of 100 people who, who appear at this page will join for the free trial, 2%. It's been largely 2% for about the last 10 years. Month one retention. At the end of that free trial, what percent continue and pay the service? 94%. How do you feel about that number? You feel good. You feel high. Okay. The lifetime value for the members. So a little trick, if you were a bad non-member product manager, You'd say something like, get free college tuition for life if you click this button. Okay? 
but your P1 retention, the month one retention, and the lifetime value will, will be horrible. So you're held accountable by this idea of lifetime value. Today it's about 180 bucks. And the acquisition cost, it costs about $50 through a variety of tactics to bring new people into the service. Now I want to make a note for any potential investors. These numbers are not correct. These are my best estimates, so I'm not giving any insider knowledge. But you should always buy more Netflix stock. Okay? <laughs> Um, but I'm doing what the non-member product manager would do at the quarterly product strategy. I've done the high-level context. Now he's bringing you into his or her world. Any numbers here surprise you? Yeah. 2%. That feels low to you. Yes. You, you, you wonder if it should be lower? It should be lower. Yeah. That's an accounting issue, okay? So today, a lot of the original content, uh, billboards for new content, the question is, how do you count that? So I use my own specific accounting techniques, okay? Did I notice, you know, this is not exactly correct, so, but you should still buy the stock. Other things that, that, uh, <laughs> any, that strike you here? I just want you to be thinking about these numbers. What? Does it feel high or low? It feels low. feels low to you. I think it's a pretty good estimate. You, they've published the number of months. Let me give you a head scratcher. People leave for two months of summer, and then they restart. How do we think about that? Did they really cancel or not? Oh. Netflix says they canceled. Okay, You're keeping it honest. Any other numbers surprise you? Yeah. Yeah, OK, his, his point was 94% people seem very committed to the service. Maybe they don't need the trial. Or maybe they were taking advantage of Netflix and forgot to cancel at the last minute. I don't know, OK? Now imagine being the product manager. Is your job clear to you? Do you know what kind of results you have to deliver? It's act I think it's a very cool job. There's not a lot of politics, a lot of metrics. Go. Yeah, I'm keeping it simple. They're going to go from 100 million to 130 million. And you're correct. There's likely a product manager focus on the US and then other countries. I don't know how many they have. Uh, but we'll do high level. Yeah. Why is LTE on a product manager focus on Because I want him to be thinking overall about the, the business, and I don't want him to, to, to do scammy things where, where we don't truly have a customer who's going to stick with us 20 months or so. Okay, That's why. Now, by the way, these metrics were all richly debated over 6, 12 months. Could we get the data? Could we actually change customer behavior? Is that the right way of measuring whether we were doing good or not? Oded? Oh, oh, Oded said, OK, 94% um, of the folks stay with the servers after the free trial. What's it look like at end of month two? And I'll share that data with you in a minute. All right, so here are the strategies. It's my job. Uh, these are all the experiments that I'm engaged in over the next year to push these metrics. So brand and positioning, gosh. When you come to the site, should it just be Stranger Things? Because that's what everyone wants. Okay? Well, that's a different way of packaging and positioning the non-member site. Price plan free trial. Oh, we're going to give you a super high def for 13 bucks, and you can have six streams going at the same time. So when your friends steal your password, it's OK. All right? This is the kind of testing that's going on. Personalization. We saw that you clicked on a specific ad banner that probably had one of the hit original titles. You come to the site, and we instantly personalize based on that same title. So instead of giving you a, a mix of titles, we give the one that's reflective of the ad banner that you clicked on. That would be an example of personalization at the top of the funnel. Multi-platform. Imagine you're in your kitchen. You say, Alexa, sign me up for Netflix. Okay, That's a new platform play. Social, 
You recommend Netflix to a friend or movie. Do they join? These are the various strategies that, that folks are engaged in. And here's a list of all the projects. So before the quarterly product strategy meeting, all of the product managers have outlined their job, their high-level strategy, the tactics, the metrics. You read all the stuff. And then the beauty of Google is you can comment. So people are deeply engaged in it. And I, I can tell who, who, who does the work in advance and who doesn't. So I do this with about a half dozen startups now. It's a highly leveraged way for me to work as an advisor. We've done all the homework up front. We've described the stuff that worked, the stuff that didn't work, and then these hypotheses of the future. And most of the work is data and design rich. You can see what the customer experience is going to be, because we have the mocks of these different non-member experiences. You're bringing the customer into the room so you can think about the experience from their point of view. All right, remember the cliffhanger? Should Netflix let you know that your free trial is almost over? So some rules of engagement for a company that doesn't like rules. You guys are allowed to ask questions. What I'd like you to do is ask enough questions to have an opinion and then engage in debate. So Netflix is very debateful. Okay? I grew up in New England. My parents invested me with a few ideas. One of them was good fights make good marriages. And I'm still married after 26 years. And they're still married at 60. Okay? This is a Netflix thing. Not argue, but debate. This is not a decision-making meeting. Now, this freaks people out. Why isn't it a decision-making meeting? Too many people. What else? It slows things down. So imagine if that person had to wait till the next quarterly product strategy meeting to decide on Kevin Spacey or not. Okay? So if a product manager does a test, they, they believe they know what the answer is, they hit the button and launch to all. So this is not a decision-making meeting. It's a place to share results. Now, this next case. Um, the product manager did wait to share the results because they were controversial. CEL level communication. So don't dumb it down for any of the newbies. Look the CEO right in the eye. His name at Netflix, at Netflix is Reed Hastings. He knows a lot. So that is your audience. Who should be in this meeting? You guys are product managers. Who do you want in the room? Engineers, how many? How many people do you want in the meeting? Give me a number. Two. It's perfect. The only challenge there was not sharing the results and learning broadly. Okay, give me a bigger number. Eight. Five. Okay. Yeah. What's twenty? Okay. So uh, work, what worked for me was sort of in the 15, 16, 17. If there were 20 or 25, it started to turn into a PowerPoint show. Um, this is very personal. Um, so uh, you know, what worked for me at 15 to 16, Reed is a very product-driven CEO. It was very helpful to have him in the room. Uh, you could help bring him up to speed. Uh, and then over time, he realized that everybody was smarter than he in each of their swim lanes, and he couldn't keep up. Um, I had the head of marketing. She had a lot of consumer insight. Uh, head of technology, super bright. Uh, I had a head of design who worked for me. I had a data who worked for me. And then I had all of the product leaders in the room. Netflix is a very product manager driven company. Um, what about finance? What about finance? Uh, it's Barry McCarthy. Um, I chose not to invite him. Okay. Um, so the trick there is, no, he's a bright guy. He's the CFO now of Spotify. He's in New York City. He'll probably watch this video. Damn him. Um, but uh, the, the, the thing you have to watch out for is we were making product decisions. And you, you know, Barry is very smart about financial decisions. Barry did not want to know my opinion on how much de debt we should take on. 
in the same way as I'm not really sure I needed his opinion on the personalization algorithm. So there are a lot of different functions that were not in the room. So think about the content partners. They're making these investment bets on House of Cards and the product's not engaged. Product is creating the merchandising system to help connect you with those movies. So this is a concept of uh, high level alignment but only loose coupling. So I didn't need my content partners or my finance partners or the damn lawyer in the room. Those are the things that sometimes slow down decision making and encourage people to take on less risk. Okay, here's the, the case. You get an email. It's a day or two. Imagine the email reminds you of how awesome Netflix is and we just want to let you know that uh, if, if you don't cancel now, we're going to hit your credit card for 10 or 11 bucks for the, for the next thing. If you show up at the site, uh, it'll tell you, hey, your free trial is about to end. Shoot, we could notify you via text if that's helpful to you. And the hypothesis here is this will decrease month one retention. There's going to be a set of people that if they didn't get the reminder would have continued with the service. That makes sense. It's going to decrease the, the lifetime value. We, we're going to lose a few people right at the beginning. But, and here's the cool thing, those people who were pissed off a day after we hit their credit card aren't going to call. So we might save like 10 bucks a call. That's cool. And maybe in the long term, there will be some goodness from this. So how many of you believe we should nicely remind you? And how many people don't? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Why don't you want to remind them? I want to know what's the financial impact. Oh, he wants to know about the financial impact. Gosh. He told you as a start that if you're going to start here, you're going to find We were super clear. Right? We told you exactly how this works. You could have put it on your calendar, correct? And you want to know how much this is going to hurt us financially, right? Okay, well, what are the other reasons that you guys don't want to do the reminder? Yep. Got it. So this is a blunt instrument. Why don't we be clever? So we, we could look. What do we do with somebody who never watched one movie in a month? What, what would your suggestion be? I would probably uh, say maybe even send them a tape. Like we've extended your trial by a month. Okay. Okay. So this is an overly simple plan. We could do some smarter things. How much time should we invest in this project? How important do you think it is to the company? Okay. So the people who think this is a good idea, tell me why. This, this is the idea. What's your name? Look, we're going to lose money for Kamesh, okay? His kids are not going to be able to afford college, okay? Doom and gloom. Okay. Why do you want to do this? Why do you want to remind people? How would you feel about a company at the last minute said, hey, we just want to be, make sure that you, you want to continue with us? How do you feel about them? Okay. Yeah, OK. Does anyone remember the uh, process it took to cancel AOL service? <laughs> like, I've been on the phone for nine hours. I just want to cancel the service, OK? That was really bad for the brand. Like, can you imagine people saying, wow, I'm really impressed with Netflix. At the last minute, they nicely reminded me. They already had my credit card. They were super clear, but they gave me this extra reminder. Wow, I feel good about that. And what happens in the long term because of that goodness? You tell a friend that you tried again. Okay, he said, you tell a friend, and, and that's another free uh, set of eyeballs coming in the service, and then you might come back later. So why, why don't you want to continue with the service right now? Like 
Yes, you. Uh, perhaps I use Amazon Prime more. The bastard's using Amazon Prime. <laughs> Or maybe it was summer, I was busy, but you know, I kind of liked it, and I'll get back to it later. These are all the reasons to do the cancel. OK, what data do you want? Good, OK. All right. Well, we haven't gone to month one yet. Let's go over that. So we know control. Let's just keep it simple. We got 100,000 folks in control. 94% go on. So the question is, what's it going to be in this test? How, what percent will continue when they've been nicely reminded that their free trial period is over, almost over? You guys want to guess at it? What? 90. Other guesses? OK, 90 and 75. How many want to go with 90? And how many want to go with 75? OK, how many of you have arms? <laughs> I want to see them all, OK? OK, this is a, you're either going to pick 90 or 75. How many go with 90? And how many go with 75? Wow, OK. So if you had been in this room quarter after quarter, you're going to guess 90. You're going to have some sense, some intuition of, of, of what's going on. Now, the 75, I just want to understand how you feel about consumer behavior. Is it your theory that there's a lot of people that are taking advantage of Netflix during a free trial? Is that, is that what your theory is? No, what was your thinking? OK, so these are busy people, and they forgot. That's really all it is. And so your theory is there's a lot of people who, a month later, get finally getting around to cancel, right? OK, so I'm going to give you the answer. 89. OK, so you're losing five people. Now, month two retention is actually a little bit better than the control, because we, we chase those folks who we're, we're going to forget out of the system already. I'll give you the data in a second. And the lifetime value drops from 181 to 177. What kind of job are you doing as product manager? Okay. Cool. Oh my god, we're going to lose 40 million bucks over this decision. Kurt, you want to be a product manager? Come on up here. This is Kurt. He has the, un the lack of fortune of knowing me and sitting in the front row. <laughs> Never do that. So Kurt, in a minute, you're going to be the product manager for non-member. Who makes the decision? Who makes this $40 billion decision at Netflix? Kurt does. <laughs> OK. Kurt, do you have any more questions? Or you can pull the audience. You know, there, There's a lot of collective wisdom in this room. Oh, Kurt, I'm making it a little easier. We, there, we saved five million bucks because people aren't calling to, to moan about, like, you never let me know that it was almost that up. And here's the big intangible. You were making a case that doing this is going to lose 40 million bucks, or maybe only 35. But wow, Netflix is impressive. They're not sliming in any way. They're perfectly transparent. They made a real effort to make sure I understood it was almost at the end of the free trial. Hmm, cool. What are you thinking, Kurt? Is this a hard or an easy decision for you? Uh, Be honest. <laughs> uh, if I'm looking, if I'm thinking short term, it's an easy decision. OK, uh, what would it be short term? You kill the email. OK. so. Um, He's thinking in the short term, I can deliver around 35, 40 million of goodness by not doing this. And in the long term, what are you thinking? Uh, I say you send the email. OK, so which way are you going to go on this? I'm just, I'm just testing you out a little bit. Are you a short-term <laughs> dude or a long-term dude? Send the email. <laughs> long-term, yeah. Uh, and why? Why do you want to do that? Because uh, I think there's a lot of, one, these aren't users that you'll necessarily lose forever. 
Um, you don't know if they're going to come back in the future. And two, um, or alongside that, the benefits of building that trust early on with them might incentivize them to come back in the long run if they want to. You are a good and trusting human. I appreciate it very much. <laughs> Let's show you the results. Okay. So 94 to 89. It's a flip in month two, and it sort of works its way out over time. But the key thing is we're going to, if we do the right thing, as Kurt suggests, we're going to lose $40 million. Okay. Let's do a little collect, collective wisdom. Okay. How many are with Kurt? We're going to send the email. And how many are not going to send the email? Change your thinking in any way? No. Okay. Good. Okay, so uh, Kurt, I'll tell you what happened. They launched the email. So this product manager, the, uh, the reason this was important is, was he, he was deeply curious to know what you all thought because um, it was hard for him. Now, I will tell you, his insight was, huh, when I go talk to the CFO, and talk about the potential loss of $40 million in a company that's $8 billion in revenue, how much is the CFO really going to care? No, I think this, the Barry McCarthy would have said, mice nuts. Okay? Um, so that's an important piece of data that I think you would have wanted to know. All right. So uh, the, the thinking was there was a positive word of mouth and a brand effect. There, a lot of belief, like you guys, that they're canceling now, but they're probably going to come back later. Like, what are they going to do? Stick with Amazon Prime? Okay. <laughs> and was this really a loss or just a revenue shift? They're going to come back. And then as you articulated, they're, they're going to tell a friend. Like, I'm really impressed with Netflix. You, you should join too. So they, they went on all of the long-term thinking here. So this is a case. That um, thank you, Kurt, for playing. Big applause. Okay, so I, I brought you into the meeting for ten minutes, um, and then you can imagine Netflix is a movie company. So the, the idea is a, a good meeting is like a, a movie. There's a well-defined script, so a very detailed agenda of how you're going to spend the day together, uh, and there's drama. Okay, you're sharing success, failure. There's the diving catches. Uh, there's not a, a requirement to let every person in the building know what's going on, and occasionally you screw up, and somebody does that last-minute diving catch, and that's okay. Diving catches are much better than the constant over-communication to make sure everything's in the right place at the right time. Strong culture of debate, decide, Kurt decide, and he walks out of the room and he hits the button, launches to all. That's debate, divide, and two. Good fights make good marriages, but everybody understand it's very data-driven, and they would be fighting one moment and best friends the next, because all they're thinking about is what's right, best for the company. And then the fancy movie term, the denouement. Okay, that's the smoking the cigarette in bed afterwards. Okay, we would all get together for a beer. And then the idea was to make each of these meetings better. So I'm a little freakish about this. There's an NPS survey after every meeting to figure out what was good and what could be better to make sure every quarter it was a better meeting. It really was a fun meeting to go to. Everybody wanted to go to this meeting because they believed that this is where the decisions were being made, this little secret place. And like, it's not a freaking decision-making meeting. Okay? Very hard to explain. So this, this meeting became a culture mechanism at Netflix. This is a way of getting highly aligned and loosely coupled, of getting everybody comfortable with candor. Like, what are you smoking? You want to send that, that, that email and lose 40 million bucks? Like, long-term goodness, uh, that's a soft brandy issue, OK? Very customer, business, and data focused. And then fast-paced learning. That, 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 that test took you a month of data, and then you just decided. Awesomeness, OK? All right, so this is what I'm hoping you will do. You will read the 17-minute article on Medium, OK? And you will lose 17 minutes of your life. 
But I'm hoping you'll start thinking about what would it be if the, the, the overall company had a clear overall product strategy, these tactics, these metrics, and then all of my swimmers in their various lanes did the same. And then try it. And your first one is going to stink. Just keep getting better. So I just want to nicely remind you that, that this is a, a process. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're trying to inspire a team. Um, so think about, in 2005, working to convince folks that we were only one or two million members. Someday we were going to be 20 million, and we didn't even believe it. So to think about the fact that it's now 100 million members, like, wow, that's just amazing. Um, so that was really what was happening, helping everybody to learn faster, to make better decisions, to, to improve the cadence of failure and then eventually figure out how to you know, dent the universe in its own special way. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And by the way, thank you all for playing. You, you guys are great um, product strat review people. So thank you. Yeah, uh, can we get the microphone runner too? What's your question? Uh, on this one. Uh, so the question was, Kurt, could we measure this hard to measure long term goodness and benefit of brand? Um, gosh. So you can measure, um, you know, uh, unaided recall, recall, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, for instance, you could see it. Remember Quickster? Anybody remember Quickster? That was a brand hit, it was measurable. It also reflected in the stock price that went from. 15 billion market cap to six. Yeah, thank you for illustrating. Um, yeah, I guess, so uh, it, you, you can't test for that in the long term. It's, it, it's, it, so there's some things you just can't know. Um, but it was just a forward bet. So I, I don't think any of the issues that the soft issue that Kurt was trying to work with are, are measurable. And by the way, the other thing about this is they, they could reverse it at any moment in time, if, if for whatever reason. Yeah? So the company I work for previously reviewed a live stream during SEO surveys. Yeah. I was curious if Netflix did that seven days after the event came out, or if you were in the control lab getting the email, um, and then measured net promoter score. Yeah. So, so his question was, could you use a proxy metric of net promoter score at seven days, for instance? So Netflix, you know, the challenge with survey data is what people say. And Netflix is much more focused on what they do, which is did they cancel or not at the, at the end of month one. But to your point, there's lots of proxy metrics that you could look at. Um, and I, I know if you calculated net promoter score for Netflix, it would have been about 80, which is awesome. Um, but we, we really believe much more at the end of the day in, in the monthly retention. Yeah, um, forgive me. Yeah, so, well, there's a lot of questions in there. Uh, there was a big transition to get from a DVD by mail to a streaming service. And was your question is? How did, where does that vision, the, these are going to be oh. Okay, great, great, okay, okay, okay. So um, the idea of Netflix, which was really born in sort of 1999, was the expectation, it was called Netflix, not DVD by mail, because there was a belief that it would eventually get to downloading. Um, the truth is that when it was started, there was an expectation that it might be uh, deeply engaged in downloading by about 2002 or 2003. And it didn't start till 2007, and it, it, the majority of members weren't streaming until about 2009, 2010. So the transition was much slower. Uh, short answer, we knew that we were going to make the transition from DVD to streaming at some point, and that was richly debated. We didn't know where the content was going to come from, and that was a surprise. Episodic TV content is a very good thing for streaming because you create a relationship with the characters, and then you can go for eight seasons, which is awesome. You can't do that with movies. Nobody wants to watch Rambo 80. Okay? <laughs> so that was a big surprise and, and learning along the way. Um, we made mistakes. So, for instance, we launched, or almost launched, 
uh, a DVD by mail service in the UK, um, which we got ahead of ourselves. In instead of waiting till we were streaming, we were wanting to learn about international. Um, that's a famous case where, where we were ready to go and chose a week before not to hit the button, largely because Amazon was rumored to be launching a DVD by mail business in the US. Um, so there are plans and then there are realities. <laughs> Um, and, and, and we learned, and we made mistakes, and we recovered quickly. Yes, uh, Dan. With, oh, I have a question. Yeah, OK. Someone owns the mic. I can't see where you I'm are. I'm over here. Hi. Sorry, I'm really small. Uh, what's the process for uh, connecting direct uh, incremental user experience with revenue? That's a great question. Um, uh, how do you think about um, better product experience and it's delivering the revenue. Uh, so in Netflix, all the product peeps were focused on improving monthly retention. And then we didn't forecast uh, uh, revenue. That was the job back then in marketing. Uh, but if you think about it, going from 8% monthly cancel to only 2% cancel each month creates a lot of business goodness. Okay. Um, but the, the simple idea was that all the product leaders were largely figuring out how do we delight our customers, and our marketing partners were, were thinking more about the revenue. I did learn something you know, over many years. I learned to sort of double down on the delight part, um, and, and that over time, if you have stuff that truly delights customers, uh, in the long term, the business will follow. And that happened again and again at Netflix. It was way cool. Um, I used to balance business and delight, and I learned over time to, to double down on the delight, which was good learning. What is, what is revenue for metric? The question was, what if revenue is your only metric? I, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I can. I mean, somebody tossed out NPS, for instance, as a proxy metric. That's a, I find it incredibly helpful for startups as a proxy for are you delighting customers? So I, I think I would challenge the question and say there must be any number of proxy metrics that you can use to, to answer the question, are we delighting customers? In your case? I, I work for a larger company. What's, there's nothing wrong with larger companies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I recognize I, I spent some time on thinking about retention, but in each case, there were a variety of proxy metrics that were informing you know, overall swim lanes. So my guess is that you can dig deeper and find proxy metrics that are, that, that are proxies for customer goodness. It's got to happen. OK, Dan, you've got the mic. Yes, I also have a revenue question, which oh, is. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we have no more time for questions. No. <laughs> Go ahead. So does this, I'm, always, I'm fascinated by the decision to add a dollar to the monthly cost, because it seems so easy. Yeah. But there's obviously must be a lot of science behind it. Does that decision inform the product development process, or vice versa? Yeah, OK. Uh, so, the, so the question was, uh, today, Netflix is, they've been gradually laid, raising prices a buck at a, at a time. Uh, the short answer is that Netflix is always testing price. So back in the day, um, I was always testing price. You know, should it be 22 or 20 bucks? Should it be 13 or 11? Um, big experiment when we launched streaming. We didn't know how to think about that. We gave it to you for free. We actually did something incredibly stupid. If you were on a $22 a month plan, we would give you 22 hours of watching for free which is really stupid. But we, we tested our way that unlimited was fine. Um, so for all of the, the, the revenue, the, the pricing, uh, it's all the results of A-B tests. There are some problems. Um, customers are clever. Um, they notice, the smart ones notice when you're testing. And then just keep refreshing browser. Um, so usually we could only initiate a test for about a week and then have to shut it. I mean, we wouldn't bring any folks in more because we had that at SKU. Uh, but short answer, it, 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 all of those price and plan things are eminently testable. And I, I'm assuming they're, they're always being tested today. And then there's some accounting issues, which is how do we think about the investment in original content? Is that, is that part of our subscriber acquisition costs, et cetera? Which 
Those are the hard questions. Strategic cost accounting, uh, and I could talk about that for one or two minutes because I'm such, so expert in it. Okay, next question. I'm sorry, the mic is owned. Uh, can you just talk a little bit more about um, like the PM, the rest of the team, like com the process for coming up with good um, non-biased proxy metrics, like the three ads in the first session or whatever, like whatever example you have, like it seems like uh, not always the easiest thing to do to sort of come up with a, a fair and unbiased yeah. proxy metric. So the so question was, uh, how did you figure out these proxy metrics? This was a big surprise to me in my first couple of months with Netflix because everything was pretty fast. And then we would debate a proxy metric for nine months. So it was hard. Um, so uh, first question was, could we actually change customer behavior in a way that moved that proxy metric? Could we actually measure the proxy metric? And then the long-term question that sometimes would take years to answer, if you move the proxy metric, would you see an improvement in retention? In some cases, those were answerable, in other cases, not. It wasn't proven for about 10 years that personalization actually improved retention. Um, so short answer is lots of debate, thought, and care uh, about are we actually looking at the right proxy metric and a real openness to maybe we're not. And is that just the product team in those cases? Do you bring in someone from data or marketing as a? You could think of it as just the product team, but uh, richly informed by the data team. Um, so, so I was, you know, my transition was from startup to real company, just bringing in consumer science or A-B testing into the mix. Um, so there was a lot of training that we all needed to, to design, execute, and analyze good tests. Uh, and today, I think Netflix is very good at it. Yes. Sarah, uh, if you could hand the microphone over your shoulder, that would be awesome. By the way, I know everyone's name here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Did, um, did you have teams that were actually building the streaming, or was that a different group? And did, did like yeah. those basic builds of the yeah. service have the same type of metrics? And sure. OK. Um, so the product team, so you saw the 10 product managers, uh, a design leader with 20 designers, a data team with 10 or 12 folks. That was the product team for me. Um, so we focused on the experience that you could see as a customer. Uh, and yes, uh, for many years, there was a technology team literally in the basement developing the technology to actually stream that. Um, but then once it was in the wild, we would test the things like the balancing act of making you wait three to five seconds versus doing the progressive streaming so you could begin to, to watch. And that was all informed by the work that the tech teams could do. Um, but most of the product folks were focused on the balancing act of you know, uh, retention versus the cost and maniacally focused on your experience as a customer. That's the way we thought about things. Yeah, this is a question for your time, actually, probably after Netflix, which is, you know, it's a pretty radical decision to let the product, like, give product managers the ability to make decisions, I would say, for a lot of, especially first-time founders. Like, how have you, have you run into cases where founders aren't particularly open to this type of, like, bottom-up approach? And what ways have you found success actually, like, bringing them along in this, like, product journey? Sure. Okay, so I would just tell you, Netflix, so Reed is an engineer. Uh, the joke with Reed, Reed is the, the CEO and co-founder. Uh, the joke with Reed is Reed never met an engineer he didn't want to hire, which was awesome, okay? Um, if you talked with him, he'd say a couple things, that his legacy was this idea of consumer science, of better living through math or the A-B testing. Uh, it took a while to get there. He said, I don't understand humans very well. I'm not an arbiter of style the way Steve Jobs would be. Um, and so he was kind of freakish in believing in the skills of a product manager. So it was bad. Like he would, he would describe engineers and designers as a pair of hands. Mike Reed, don't say that. Um, so he really believed that the product managers had the consumer insight that was informed by data and math and qualitative and all these sources of data. So that was awesome. Um, yes, every company's different. So my next company is Chegg. Uh, the, my CEO is a sales guy. And Dan Rosenzweig never met a salesperson he didn't want to hire. So it was a very different environment. 
Um, and I actually started with a very similar product manager led organization. Over time, I went to a GM structure because we found ourselves in multiple business textbook rental, a monthly homework help service, and really connecting students with their first jobs out of college. Um, so, really, the point is there's no one right way to do this. Uh, and my only thing on uh, organizational design is, like all things, experiment and see what works and what doesn't, depending on your product and business and the people that you have. Most people don't like to experiment with people, uh, but we've, like, we experimented with different organizational and, uh, design at Netflix all the time. It was incredibly helpful. Yes, yes, my, my friend, you are awesome. What's your question? I'm still at a loss for the 40 million, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we'll, we'll pay it to you later. Um, there seems to be a focus from a product management perspective to focus on the benefits or the value of all the features that you're focused on, right? Um, I'm pretty sure when you started, you, at the start, you would not have approved of a feature that would have cost you $40 million. True. So yep. what are some of the things, maybe similar question, what are some of the things that you have to do to have that cultural shift where the decision making moves away from the CFO or the, the financial folks to move towards product management? What are yep. the yeah, so there's two questions. Um, there's some reality in going from startup to, to a company that makes a lot of money today. Uh, and then what are the cultural shifts that, that get to a place where a company can happily leave $40 million on the table because it's the right thing to do? Okay, so reality. Um, you know, in startups, you, you often do what it takes to get the next round of funding. Um, so at Netflix, we actually did some really stinky things in the early stages. Um, we made it hard to cancel the service. We made it hard to find the 800 number. There was a horrible case where Reed Hastings was on 60 Minutes, and the, the interviewer did a gotcha and said, Reed, can you find the 800 number on the website? He said, yes. And then it was like four minutes of agonizing, painful things to watch. <laughs> okay? um, so th those were the things that we were engaged in that we did at a time where we, didn't really, we couldn't afford the money. Okay? And that's reality. Um, on that curve, our big aha, we, we, we were sued for throttling. Um, and we realized that we weren't transparent about that. And so we asked ourselves, what are the other things that we were either going to tell everybody we're doing or we'll cut the practice? Uh, but we did that circa 2007 when we could afford it. Clearly, they can afford the $40 million today. Um, so those, that's just reality stages of company. The cultural issues, I mean, companies change when they see positive results. Um, so we were able to demonstrate positive results through improved retention that was good for customers and good for the business. And that builds trust. Uh, and this idea of high business maturity, over time you knew who, who, who you could trust to make great decisions about business product uh, and the people. Uh, and that's just earned. You just earn it. And, and so th those are the things that uh, enable that over time. Okay, I'm going to take one more question. Uh, hang on a second. Uh, me? Oh, you have Maybe a microphone? Oh. Yes. Where are you? Oh. oh, I'm over here on your right. Okay. Oh, this is exciting. Hello, Michelle. Melinda. Melinda. Very close. close. Yes. Close. Um, earlier you were talking about having like 15 to 20 engineers in the product strategy meeting, but is that all of the engineers from that swim lane, or is that the swim lane plus other engineers? Yeah. Yep. Okay. The question is in that meeting. Okay. So back in my day where I had sort of an allergic reaction to more than 15 or 20 people in the room, um, uh, I was, I had some of the, I had my engineering partners in the room. There were two of them. And then a, a couple depending on the topic for the day. I've asked the question today. So Netflix is at a huge scale. They continue to have this meeting. Um, really what happens now is people go in and out of the room depending on what the topic is. They know the agenda. They know the stuff they're interested in. They've made all their comments and thoughts in the Google Doc, and then they're there. So at any moment in time, there's 15 or 20 people that may be debating. Another cultural issue that was fascinating to me, um, they realized that it became a Jeopardy culture, which is people 
needed to yell their comment as quick as they could, hit the button really quick. And they realized that not everybody operates that. There are very, very thoughtful, smart introverts that are not good button pushers. Um, so this cracked me up. It's now a hand-raising culture. So t today, people, I mean, if you raised your hand back in 2006, Reed would like shoot you. You don't have to raise your frickin' hand, OK? Uh, but today, raise hands so that all of those opinions could be known and understood. So this is, this is just something that evolves over time. I think for every one of you, if you try stuff like this, you'll find the thing that you know uniquely works for you. And it will take you know, a year or so to evolve for something that you, that you find to be a truly helpful meeting where people describe this good meeting being like a movie, which is awesome. All right, so with that, I want to thank you very much for being here. I'm going to stay forever. I'm on West Coast time. Um, so thank you very much for being here. Oh, 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 I really screwed up. I really screwed up. This is important. Um, you can find the article, easy. This is the important part. So I need your feedback. Andrea needs your feedback. You're going to get an email from both of us. Okay? Pick one. <laughs> uh, but my point is my consumer science, my, I, I, I can't retain you. I wish I could. Um, but I can get an NPS. And if half of you, if half of you respond, I will share the results with all of you. That's a, I'm trying to get your intellectual curiosity in the game. So I would love, love, love feedback. And Andrea would love, love, love feedback even more. So thank you very much.